called you Superman. Hi. No, I was like, please welcome hey. Steam K. Yes. So I'll go right here so I can see everybody. Is this one working here? Hello. Yes, Hello. Hi. Hello. I'm a little tardy. I was getting a tattoo. We heard. Yeah, we heard. Show. Let's see it. Let's see. It's right there. Oh. <laughs> Look, there's my blood. But, uh, but tell them what it is, because that's it, cool. Yeah, that'll what it work. is, is uh, I, I've had a tattoo there. It's a, uh, it's a copy of my son's birthmark on his arm. Oh. And it was just sort of the wrong color, so they recolored it in for me. Oh. But that was it. Oh, it's a little cool. tattoo. He's got a little pigmentation thing on his arm, and now I do too. So it's cool. That's very nice. But I didn't know my panel was now, so we were hustling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we did finish it, so it's not like halfway done. They've learned that when the guy with the tux is hovering over them, <laughs> time to go. I'm supposed to be somewhere. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, I was getting the tattoo, and all of a sudden the guy looks up and he's like, okay, you're done. So what do you mean? <laughs> he's hovering. No, they finished it. It was done. All right, so uh, if we're going to ask a question, we have some, a microphone over there, and uh, you can either just yell it out at him, because uh, we only got about 100 or so people in here, or you can go to the microphone if you have a voice like she probably can't go. So, Dean, <laughs> how cool was it to play Superman? Very, there it is. Uh, anybody have any questions? Anybody? Anybody at all? Yes, sir. Uh, I watch the Superman show on the Hub every Sunday. It's awesome. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'd like to know, uh, based on how season four ended, it looked like you guys were ready for season five. I mean, the weird cliffhanger with the kid, the doorstep. What, what, what were the plans for season five? Were there any? Uh, that's a darn good question. The answer is, uh, well, we were picked up for season five, first of all. We were picked up. They brought us in and um, said, congratulations, you're going to season five. And um, I was excited. Um, they gave me TV. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and uh, um, in the summertime there, they, they called and said that, that Terry had gotten pregnant and really couldn't work, and that's what ended this, this show. Um, we were definitely going for... Um, uh, I, I was pushing for the, the sort of the kid angle because there had never been any sort of uh, really rules written. It hadn't been something that happened where, where Lois and Clark had a child. I mean, if you have Kryptonian and an Earth person have a child, there really weren't rules. And I thought that'd be an awful lot of fun to, to create the rules. And, you know, obviously there's different things that could happen. Um, and, you know, maybe they, the, the child would... Uh, it wasn't our child was the idea behind it. It was... It was but I think what was going to happen was that um, Lois and Clark were going to find out what it was like to parent and um, the, the harsh hardships and the things that happen and, and how your life gets put on hold to, to a certain degree or how someone's more important than your own personal life. And then I think that the real parents were probably going to come back and reclaim the child. And of course that was going to break their hearts and probably I imagine then they would have their own. Um, and I thought it'd be fun to, to sort of make the rules like, you know, the baby's born and then three days later it's 13. <laughs> Stuff like I, who knows? Uh, they did a funny little bit where they had, you know, where she was was uh, concerned about what would happen, and you know, the little babies are, you know, flying and stuff like that, which I thought was hysterical. And there really could have been a lot of fun with that. Um, and it was my intention to sort of push that and drive it forward, and and I guess sort of create like a, a, a Smallville sort of spinoff, which would have been my spinoff yeah. instead Woo! of those guys, which would have been great because uh, they had a nice long run. But that was sort of the intent, uh, at least in my in my house, in my brain. Uh, I don't really know what the producers were going to do uh, vis-a-vis the, the, the baby, but I, I think that was pretty clearly the idea. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> uh, they say imitation is a sincerest form of flattery. What's up with the man crush that Seth MacFarlane has on you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'll, if, that, if that's flat, I'll take it. I don't I'll know. take it. <laughs> Seth MacFarlane is very, very funny. Um, you know, anytime you can get made fun of uh, on any, I figure for me it's a badge of honor. Well, you did Robot Chicken too. Yeah, so I did Robot I mean, Chicken. You know, too. so I mean, you know. Those guys, listen, those guys are great. And I, part of uh, when you when you when you play roles when you're a, a public figure in a sense, you're gonna get made fun of no matter what you do. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I think it's hysterical. I'm laughing more than anybody. I've got that Seth MacFarlane T-shirt. A big old fat Superman with the S on. Yeah. I wear it. I, I'm not gonna lie. But, I don't wear it in public because. Did you see the one in the Cleveland show that, with uh, Dean Cain is a terrible person? 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I would, I, if, I had, if I could have a video loop running on my, in my house, I would have that running. I think it's hysterical. Um, you know, I, I make fun of myself anytime possible. And, and if you start taking yourself too seriously or, or believe the hype one way or the other, up or down, you're, you're in big trouble in this business. So, um, yeah, um, I, my family quotes that Dean Cain is a terrible person. I said, thank you, son, now go to bed. <laughs> and I just got another one, just all totally up thing. Um, as we know in Philly, we had talked about, remember I gave you that one question about a Super Bowl, Emmy, Nobel Prize. Um, can you keep us up to date on your charities that, you know, because I know Wounded Warriors you did and stuff like that, but anything else we've been working on? Or? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> Wounded Warrior Project is, a, is a, a, right. big, a, a big charity of mine that I really like to support. In fact, I'm hosting a thing in uh, next month, um, a Step Forward campaign for them. It's a whole big show. Actually, Samantha Harris and I are co-hosting it, sure. a big event for those guys. Um, you know, I love that right, Wounded yeah. Warrior Project shot there. I'm going to go buy that one myself. Um, it's... You know, our, our men and women who are out there fighting everything. I, 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 having done Stars Earn Stripes and yeah. been out there with these guys, and <clears throat> then something like what happens at our, our consulate in Libya takes place, and then now I know the guys who know the guys. Right. Like those two SEALs who passed, these guys know them. Right. So I, I know a lot about those guys, and I know a lot about the situation. It's, it really hits home, yeah. and it's tough. Those guys are amazing. They ran, they're the guys who run to the fight, and they were a half mile away. They came in to try to do their job, and try to help these guys out and cost them their lives, and that's what they do. Um, and if they end up with a catastrophic you know, injury, Wounded Warrior Project for me is a, such a great charity because it helps them get back on their feet. And they always say it's, it's not a hand out, it's a hand up. Yeah. That's all they need. Yeah. But I, I mean, the thing about being, the, the, it's wonderful to be able to do charity work, <clears throat> and being the public eye, you get a lot of opportunities. And I've said it before, you could, I could literally do charity work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. Just saying, do you got the, uh, was it Darfur, you get, was it the, was it the one you had with the African? Um, I went down to Kenya and I did a lot. Yeah, yeah, down to yeah. Kenya, it was Feed the, it was, uh, yeah, feed the so Children. <clears throat> Darwin Awards you do, I mean, it's yeah. just like, you know. Yeah, I do as much charity <laughs> as I can, which is, which is great. Right. Um, and, you know, there's so many people that need the, the help across the world and, and a ton here in the United States. And then <clears throat> having a 12-year-old son he has to uh, commit, you know, complete community service at the school right. he goes to. And so it's great for me because now I, I have an excuse to take him along with me and really show him right. things, whether it's here or abroad. And uh, and I do. So I'm I'm raising a kid who's uh, very well aware of public service, and it's, and it's pretty great. Awesome. Right. You know, we get to work with a lot of celebrities at these shows, and, and I'm not just blowing smoke here. He is the single nicest man yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. So I laugh when I, when I hear the skits and stuff. He Kane's a terrible person. I'm like, what the hell? Because <laughs> he really is. And and this is Dean Kane. I don't know. I know some of y'all watching these panels. Sometimes like the celebrities put on a little bit of an act to impress you. And, and this is him. It's so I, enjoy I it. I can't act. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to get rid of that nice guy image. I got a tattoo. Come on. Yeah. Tough guy. Tough guy. I'm a tough guy. You had a question, sir. You were brave enough to go up to the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, Dean, thanks for being here. I, I wanted you. to ask you, like, I do think you have definitely a very sort of Superman look, but I was wondering if you could talk maybe a little bit about how you sort of came across that role, maybe how you were ultimately selected for it. It, it was a, just an audition, like any other audition, and I was young, and um, I'd have three or four or five auditions a week, and uh, I heard about this show, and... I went in and I, I had met the casting directors before. It's a process in Hollywood. <clears throat> and you, excuse me. And you see a lot of the same actors who eventually make it, which is interesting because you're like, okay, we were. All, I remember we were all in the same room 19 times for 19 different projects. And there's, you know, for every hundred you go on, you get one uh, if you're lucky. And um, I went in on that audition, and uh, uh, I was the first person the producers saw. I didn't do their sort of the preliminary auditioning because I guess. They said, hey, this kid's kind of right for it or whatever. And uh, I was young. I was certainly young for the role. There'd never been someone that young playing the role. And I read the script and I came in. And, uh, you know, I remember re hearing Bruce Willis talk about his moonlighting audition. He was like late for something and this or that. He kind of whipped in there and did it. And, and his attitude was sort of perfect for it. I remember not thinking this was a big deal. Uh, but going in there and doing the job that I, I said, I have a different take on this maybe than other people. And a guy named Robert Butler, who had done Hill Street Blues and a number of other great shows. He was known as the pilot maker. 
Um, he, if he did it, it's going to series. He was in there. He's like, okay, you stop me. He's like, great, let's see what you got. Mm -hmm. I read the scenes. He didn't say it. He's like, okay, thanks. Goodbye. I said, okay, <laughs> bye, thanks. There goes that one, you know, and I uh, uh, had gone on several other auditions the next couple of weeks. And usually, you know, within a couple of days, a day or two, they you get a real, hey, they really liked you. This is something that might happen. I didn't hear anything. I was, I was done with that. And it was a couple of weeks later, and I was going to a party, and there was a girl from the casting office or something, someone I didn't know. And um, <clears throat> he was talk, she was talking to one of my friends and said, hey, your, your friend Dean, they, they really like him for that Superman thing. And he's like, hey, did you know this? And I was like, what are you talking? That was two weeks ago. That's over. And then the next couple of days, they're, they're suddenly, they wanted to bring everybody back in. And I guess they had been seeing everybody. And then uh, we started auditioning again, and uh, it felt really comfortable to me. And I was doing a good job, and it was, I was very young and very green, and it was tough. Uh, I was hanging in there. And then they, one night, they were whittling it down to fewer of us. Then they rewrote a scene. They wrote a whole new scene just for an audition. And when I read that scene that night that we were going to do the next day, I was like, got it. I know what, and the scene was, Lois was a little intoxicated and comes into Clark's apartment and wants to dance. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he wouldn't do that because he's so moral. You know, he, he would, he, as much as he wanted to, uh, he wouldn't do that. Um, so it took a great deal of acting. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, that, I, I sort of really understood the character at that point in time in the relationship. And, uh, that took that at that point in time. I felt like it was uh, it was my role to lose, and they were concerned about my age because I was young, and uh, I think that Robert Butler, um, and ultimately Les Moonves, who was the head of Warner Brothers Television at the time, now he's the head of Viacom, so he's like the leader of the media, if you will. Um, he uh, he made the call and said, "Look, let's give this kid a shot. We think he's the right guy," and, and that was it. So I, I still thank uh, Les Moonves and and Bob Butler for giving me that that shot. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Young lady? Um, first of all, I'm a huge fan, and I can't believe I'm sitting here right now. <laughs> <laughs> Been driving my husband nuts for a week. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, out of all the roles that you've played, what do you think that you, which one do you think you kind of relate to the most that's more like you? Well, Superman, of course, because I can fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say you know Clark Kent was my the, my favorite role that I've played. And when you when you do a role in a series, you get so much time to play it. And I've played it for what, 90 hours or 85 hours or 80 whatever it is. You, you know when you're doing a film, you get to play a character, and the film is you know 110, 120 minutes long, maybe two hours at max. And so you there's a lot less time to develop a character, a lot more time spent shooting the scenes and things. But um, it's nothing like doing a series when you really get to inhabit a character for a long time. So clearly Clark Kent to me was my, the favorite role I've ever had, um, and I loved it. Um, you know, in the film world, I think my favorite role I've ever had was, uh, was uh, Out of Time opposite Denzel Washington, because that was great. Uh, he is, you know, the best of the best as an actor. And it's really great to, to work opposite somebody who's that good. Um, but, you know, it's hard to make a living. You, should go ahead, you just almost sneeze. You should let that out. No. Oh, no? <laughs> um, and it's great, but it's tough to make a living doing those kind of films because Denzel got you know $20 million and everyone else got five bucks. And it's tough. Yeah. And I, it was a 14-week shoot. I could have shot my stuff in a week, but I had to go on his schedule. So it's, it's really tough for an actor to make a living in that, in that sense. I mean, the, the, the world changes a lot more, but that's why you see so many people going to television mm -hmm. because they want to make a living and they want to have a steady gig. And... And television offers that, you know. So, but Clark Kent for sure. And the wonderful blue hat. You can't miss that hat. <laughs> um, I am not so much a chick flick kind of girl, but um, the way home I thought was fantastically fabulous. So kudos to you. That was awesome. Thank you very much. That was uh, one of the most difficult movies for me to shoot. A movie called The Way Home because it dealt with a, a family. Losing their uh, three-year-old child, they had they had um, other children, older children, and, and the three-year-old went missing. And uh, it was in rural uh, Georgia, and they had a lot of uh, uh, heavy equipment nearby in the farms that they ran, and, and there were a lot of uh, ponds and places like that. And if you're a parent, you know it just takes a second when you look away and your child goes missing, and then they're gone. I've had that happen a hundred times with my own son. And that feeling is just awful. So we shot it at the place where it took place. 
uh, at, at the family's house. The little boy, who went, we ended up finding the boy. The boy was, in, was found and was fine. But he was, of course, running around. So here we are doing the whole thing and with all the real people and all the stuff. It was, it was really a unique experience. And, um, and the, the guy who I played, uh, Randy, would sit there and watch the scenes and then he, he would just be bawling. Mm -hmm. And because uh, just remembering it, it changed his life. And in, in, in a sense, it changed mine. But my priorities, his, Randy's priorities, the character I played in The Real Man, he, they were a little out of whack at the time, per his own words. That I don't think mine have been. My son's been sort of the focus of my life since he's since before he was in this world, and uh, and he continues to be today. So, so I'm okay with that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. After being the Superman of the '90s, what did you think of the new <laughs> Superman movie in the 2000s with? Uh, Ran around <clears throat> the Superman of the '90s. I like that. I want a shirt that says that I was the Superman of the '90s. <laughs> I'm a good person. Um, uh, look, I, I know Brandon Routh. He's a really great guy, and he's a good actor. And uh, uh, he did a great job in the film, um, as best he could do in that film. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that film, um, and it's, it's no fault of Brandon's at all. Uh, I think he, you know, they did a, a lot of interesting things, making him, I mean, he looks so much like Christopher Reeve, it was amazing, and they certainly pushed those similarities. Um, they did a lot of things that I didn't like in the story. I didn't like the fact that uh, Superman wasn't raising his own child and was sort of allowing someone else to do that, and that's okay to have, I was raised by a stepfather, and that's great. I think it's a wonderful place for that, but uh, Super Superman is not an absentee father. I just I could not get past that being a father in my own life, uh, and it just was a little discombobulated for me. The, the story was there was so much to it. Um, uh, I feel bad for Brandon because I think that was um, I think the movie's gotten you know pretty well panned. Um, uh, I feel bad for him because he's a great guy and a good actor. Um, I think the next one. Uh, is going to improve greatly. I think Henry Cavill will do a great job. And uh, the effects have gone so far since uh, the Superman of the 90s. <laughs> that, uh, it's amazing the stuff they can do. But I don't care how good your effects are, if the story doesn't hold you, you're not going to pay attention. Yeah. And uh, I watch these other shows now, whether it's uh, you know, Batman or, or Spider-Man or these things, and they're playing, some of the, they're playing the same moments that we played on Lois and Clark a hundred times. And, I, and it's great, but I'm like, oh, that was episode 27. <laughs> and Toby McGuire's doing that now, that's not fair. Uh, but it, it's great, and, and it's fun because, uh, because Lois and Clark is now airing on The Hub, and my son, I have the DVDs, he won't watch them. <laughs> but it's on The Hub, because if it has commercials, apparently it's, it means something else, and he'll watch it then. And the other day he watched about two and a half episodes straight through, and he's like, Dad, it's pretty good. <laughs> That's what I've been telling you for 12 years. You said, Listen to me. Um, so it's, it's nice that he'll sit and watch it and, and enjoy it. Um, but he certainly understands it. It's, uh, it's acting because he knows I can't fly <laughs> as much as I've tried. <laughs> One more. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, also, it was cool to see you on Smallville. That was kind of like a nice little treat for all of us fans. So thank you. Well, Christopher Reeve went and did Smallville, and uh, when Sir Christopher Reeve goes into Smallville, you know, you can't say, oh, well, I'm not gonna do that. There's no way, he set the bar very high, and I think pretty much all of us feel the same way, and I know Terry went and did something on Smallville as well, and uh, I was honored to go there and, and, and be a part of that lore and sort of keep that going. Uh, it's great, you know, I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, Tom Welling needs to take like six years off now. He's probably still exhausted. <laughs> it's exhausting, you know, that's 10 years. I can't even imagine. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, earlier you mentioned having so many hours to play the character. What kind of input did you have in the character development? You know, it's, such a well -known character? that's a great question. Um, whenever you see a series, look at Friends. If you look at the pilot episode of Friends, um, it's not what the characters ended up being. No. Because actors always have an input, no. and there's things that you do well that they don't know, and there's things you don't do well um, that you know, they, they start to write away from it. They start to write to your strengths if they can. Um, I, I try to bring as much, um, you know, the, the, my, my sensibility to the character. It's hard to know because it's a slowly morphing process. Um, I think I, as, as when I first got there, uh, I was as green as Clark Kent was coming to Metropolis, I'll be honest. So 
it worked to my to my advantage, I think, uh, in that sense. Um, and I, you know, we I wrote a couple of the episodes, and you, they always allowed us to. I mean, I was always a couple weeks ahead on the scripts. Like I, when I walked on the set, I I have already gone through everything that made sense or doesn't make sense to me two weeks beforehand. I addressed the problems and. Um, they allow that sort of input, which is great, because you get a directors coming in for one episode, and you're playing this character for three years. They're not going to say, "Okay, I want you to feel this." And you're like, "Come on, man! I, I do this every. Look, I'm in the cape. I do it every day." <laughs> um, so it's, and they don't really do that. They sort of set the scene, and let you do your your deal. Um, but it, it's, uh, you have a strong input. You, you have to after a long period of time, and uh, there were some there, there were some things that. Uh, um, you know, there's always, in any show you first start, there's always, they're always going to have it a little bit off, and then the show sort of finds its legs, and that, that goes with my character, I'm sure it went with Terry's character and everybody else as well, so they, you get a great bit of input. Otherwise, you, you know, you, you're going to be very unhappy and it's going to show up on the show. They're like, what's wrong with that one character? You know, so, you get booted. Yes, sir. We're right over here. As an actor, Dean, how much, uh, when, you're, when you're playing, you know, like a, an established character like Superman, how much temptation is there to play off of what like Christopher Reeve and even George Reeve did before that as opposed to taking it in your, you know, like a, what you might consider like a radical new direction? You know, that's, a, that's a, another great question, yeah. For me, it was very simple. Um, I loved the way that uh, George Reeve, Reeves played uh, his Clark Kent. I mean, it was a man. It was a man, man. You go back and watch that, and that was great. Um, the, I understood the choices they did with Christopher Reeve, and that was the Superman I grew up with. Christopher Reeve uh, playing the, the geeky Clark Kent and trying to make it so you didn't, you wouldn't suspect the two of them to be the same. But I mean, come on, you have to buy into the fact that, like, in one of our shows, I guess Tempest was the character. It's so, like, you know, who am I? Now you know who I am. No, duh. Right? So if you don't buy into that part of it, uh, you're really not going to buy into the Superman story. Uh, so for me, it was I, I sort of borrowed from from uh, George Reeves, uh, Clark Kent, and then from Christopher Reeves, Superman, and that was kind of it. And it's impossible not to be influenced by them when you see it. And you know, DC Comics worked really very closely with us, and they were watching everything we did. And uh, our, you know, your group of producers over there watching you. So you, you do what you do what you can. And if you start going the wrong direction, they'll they'll let you know. But um, it was pretty straightforward. Yeah, that'd be a smack. Um, they hit you where it hurts. Wallet. Um, so uh, that, for me, though, those are the those are the biggest influences. I love the way that uh, Christopher Reeve played Superman, and I, and I really love the way that uh, George Reeve played uh, Clark. And so that's where I borrowed from. But also, it was on the page too. The the sensibility that Deborah Joy Levine created with the the Clark character was was great. And it was there, and um, and, and, and and so it was it was a combination of those those several factors, but. Taking him in a radical di direction, doing something completely radically different, that would scare the pants off me. I wouldn't even want to, because I, I, I love where Superman is, and I, and I love his morality. That's why it's going to be interesting to see what they do with the film. Um, I thought they missed it on the last film, because I don't think his morality was strong enough, and I don't think he was as heroic a character as he could have been, and to me, he's the most heroic of all the superheroes. It was too few. Mm -hmm. too. One of the things that I really love, you mentioned that the show taking things in different places that haven't been explored yet in the Superman mythos, and I thought that was really a strength of Lois and Clark. I always look at Superman as there's Clark Kent who has to hide that he's Superman. There's Superman who has to hide that he's Clark Kent. But one of the things I thought the show really explored great was his time with his parents, where we got to see both of those masks drop, and we got to see the real, who I think is the real Clark Kent. And I thought the show really went to a lot of depth on that. Can you speak a little bit about the relationship of those scenes and working with those the great actor and actress who played the parents. Because I just thought those scenes, you, the three of you together, or even when you were one on one with each of those actors, I thought they were some of my favorite scenes and most endearing from the show. No, that's a that's a, I agree 100. Um, percent uh, Eddie Jones and Kay Callum played the parents, <clears throat> and they were great. In fact, in the audition process, one of the scenes was was in the pilot was when Clark is you know wrestling with his superpowers and the things that he can do when talking to his father and so on and so forth. That was the crux. You're absolutely right. That's exactly who Clark Kent really is. And that's who we all are when we're you know, talking to your parents. Your parents know you better than anybody and they know you in your strongest and your weakest moments and they know your fears and everything. Uh, and that and that's that's a great thing. And and it hadn't been really you know, this the the 
this it never had been explored before. You know, the having Jor-El be a you know an image up there talking to the kid. It's not the same as the guy who raised him. Um, and I, I'm my stepfather is the one who raised me, and he is the one who guided my morality and did everything that for me. And and it's extremely important. So you know, when you take this <clears throat> most powerful being on the planet and give him small town American values. It's a great, really strong uh, story. Um, and to be able to see him in, the, in those moments, it, for me, that was the heart of the character, without a doubt. Um, and Deborah Jo Levine knew that, and she did that when she created the show. I mean, that was one of the first, again, it was one of my three audition scenes. So, <coughs> excuse me, I blame that cough on my son as well. <laughs> they get sick, you're gonna get sick like four days later, you just gotta deal with it, right? Um, uh, so, so there was no question. That was the heart of the show, and that's that's that, it's been regularly pointed out. Uh, by the way, I think that's really a, an astute view because um, th that's definitely where he got all of his morality, and that's 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 who he really is. And it's great, that you, you know, we all have different facets of our personality, and it's great that you know we were able to explore all the different ones with Clark. But yeah, thank you for that. Well, I love that aspect of the show. So that, it, it was, I thought it was a great strength. And you know, when a kid sits there and watches the show. Like my own son <clears throat> watches it and watches the parents guiding Superman, if you will. It's really strong. It's a strong message, and it's great. So yes, I completely agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I probably have to until after the panel's over, but for sure. How old is she today? No, don't tell me that. I'm kidding. <laughs> you better not answer that. If yeah, exactly. Twenty nine. Exactly. Perfect answer. You know, I, there's a movie Kill Bill, Kill Bill the second version, and, and I love the uh, little monologue that they give about Superman, where he says that you know, Batman is really Bruce Wayne. All the other heroes have their alter identity, but. Clark Kent's the alter identity to Superman because Superman is really Superman. That's not his secret. And I always thought watching the show that, uh, you know, your character, and the, and the writing and everything kind of epitomized that. And I didn't really realize that it is an astute observation about the family. Yeah, That's yeah. really what kind of tied it all together. You were grounded by your parents. And there's the funny things, you know, it's Superman, but his mom still comes in and <laughs> rearranges his house and then, by the way my mom comes into my house and rearranges it every single time and it drives me crazy so if you ever talk to my mom tell her to stop rearranging my house please um, but it's the kind of things that, that we all go through it's normal everyday family stuff and it's hysterical it's fun it's fun to see it I didn't see Kill Bill part two so I can't comment on that it's, it's a great um, who saw that monologue that I'm talking about it's, it's a pretty interesting monologue he gives about the dichotomy of it I'm gonna have to Look that up on YouTube. You can do that now, you know. Yes, you can. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> so you were like, you know, super athlete, and if y'all didn't know this, you actually went to Princeton. Yes, sir. So, you know, good looks and brains, too. <laughs> and That's you, open to speculation. At, at what point did you decide, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be the sports superstar, I don't want to be a nuclear physicist, I'm a damn good actor. <laughs> when, when did that realization, how old were you, do you think? You know, I was in college when I decided I was going to work in film, and I wasn't sure how long it was going to take. I thought I was going to have a longer professional career than I did in football. So my, my plan was to be a screenwriter during the day and play football. I mean, I'm sorry, but screenwriter during the night, play football during the day, you know, exercise my brain, exercise my body, and do those two things. And um, within about three months of graduating from college, um, I was done with school and I was done playing football. And I was like, okay, that happened fast. Um, my father was a director, so I grew up in film, around film. I grew up with kids who became very famous actors, but they were just kids, you know, they were from Sean Penn to, <coughs> excuse me, you know, Emilio Estevez, Rob Lowe, Charlie Sheen, and all these kids I grew up with playing sports with. And um, I watched them all become actors. And they were all older than I was, and, and uh, uh, watched them become famous and, and, uh, make some really bad mistakes, <laughs> almost every single one of them. And uh, I, was, I wasn't I was thinking about, I was still wanted to go to college. I remember I did one film with my father when I was 17 years old called The Stone Boy. And it was between my junior and senior year of high school. And I only got the role because I looked like the kid who was playing the main kid. And I was sitting there one day and they go, you look like the kid, why don't you try it? And I was terrible, but it, I got the role because they didn't have anybody else. And I remember someone took me, an agent said, you know, I was getting ready to go to college and they go, you, you have a real 
charted a career as an actor. So don't go to college and play football. You should start acting. And I was like, you are ridiculous. Are you kidding me? You know, don't go, don't go to Princeton and don't play football. I, like, why even be here? You know, it, uh, it didn't make any sense to me at all. I thought it was like literally the funniest thing I'd ever heard. Um, but then as I, as I went to college and I uh, had got a great education and really enjoyed playing football and had an opportunity to go to the NFL and I said, okay. Uh, you know, in the, in the times in between, I would go visit with my friends in the summer times and look at their internships and the things they did on Wall Street or, you know, the investment banking and things like that. And I said, I would die doing these. I could not do those jobs. I could not put on a suit and go to work every day, 103rd floor of a building. I was like, this is just horrible. I, there's no way. Um, so then the, the world of filmmaking became much more uh, uh, attractive to me. And... Uh, uh, and then I started doing that in the summer times when I was home, and uh, I had planned on, on getting into it slowly, but uh, ha you know, finishing school and finishing football within three months, uh, you know, of turning 22, I um, I started, you know, working at it very hard, and uh, it's a process. My dad's advice on being an actor was very simple: he had three words for it: don't do it. <laughs> so he said, be a, "Be a writer." You know, he didn't want me to be up there and, and have to deal with the, with the, the judgment and then the rejection that you get as an actor, and, and that's constant in being an actor. Um, and I understand that as a father because I don't want my son to be um, judged that way and, and 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 to be picked on in that sense. Uh, if he chooses to do it, great, that's fine. But uh, it's, it's it's a tough business. It's tougher on women than it is for men too, by the way. So. And I, I'm well aware of that that fact, but uh, um, you know, it's a. I didn't really want to be like my friends, but uh, that I, well, my peers that I saw grow up and go ahead of me. My father directed Young Guns, so I saw all these guys when I was still in college. They were they were, you know, hitting it big and having a blast and being called the sexiest man in the world. I'm like, Rob Lowe's not the sexiest guy in the world. He got thrown in the pool at that party like two weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, but you know, you see the ridiculousness of, of what happens in the press, and, and uh, uh, you see the mistakes people make. And you, I tried not to make those mistakes, but um, I just really realized that it was a, a career path that was a, a lot more fun uh, than than being on Wall Street. That's for sure. The Daily Grind. Yeah, no, thank you. Now, so now, now, see, this is the problem I have right here. You've got Dean Kane sitting ten feet in front of you. If you're gonna ask a question, you better own it. None of, none of this. You go, buddy. I got a question. I got a question. You go, darling. What's your favorite artifact in the Rick Lee's museum? Oh, that's a good question. It's a very good question. My favorite. The, I'm a history major from college, so I am just fascinated by history. And I just There's yes, one. you and me. That's yes. it. Uh, I love it because this is a great story, and it's just people and the weird things that happen. And you know, so my favorite artifact that I ever saw was when John Wilkes Booth assassinated um, Abraham Lincoln. He did it with a derringer, and when he shot him and he jumped off of the the, the box up top and landed on the stage, he, John Wilkes Booth broke his leg. And also, another derringer with his name on it fell out of his pocket. It's not the one he used to shoot uh, the president, but it was his backup. And to have that, I had that in my hand. I was like, that's, it's, that's a real piece of history. And I thought that was one of the most amazing things that I've ever held in my hand. Even more amazing than that one guy's head. <laughs> yeah, I had this, they, they took this one guy who, who was a big criminal and they preserved his head. And they cut that open and I could take his head and open it. And I thought, that's interesting, but not as interesting as the Derringer that, that John Wilkes Booth had, had in his hand. I thought that was really amazing to see that firsthand. So that was definitely my favorite artifact. Brave young lady in the back of the glasses. Um, I have kind of a couple prompt question. How was it to work with Harv Presnell? And did you have a favorite guest star, or is there someone else you really wish could have come on and guest starred on Lois and Clark or in uh, Well, Harv Presnell, is, to answer the first part of the question, has the greatest voice in the history of like voices, horror, but I can't even do it. Uh, great guy, he played Lois's father. Um, Great to work with him. You know, he, the, his career is so fantastic. He's done so many different things. Uh, just a just a great guy. So a lot of fun to listen to his stories and watch him on set. And um, he was just uh, so much fun, so much childlike, youth, youthful energy for a gentleman who wasn't, you know, as young as maybe I was at the time. 
So he was great. Um, I said before, Raquel Wells was one of my favorite guest stars ever to have on Lois and Clark, just because she's such a legend. Tony Curtis was fantastic, too. Um, but if we could have ever had one guest star, uh, I think the greatest ever would have been to have Christopher Reeve. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would have been Absolutely. amazing. Yeah. And it's um, still one of my regrets that I have is that I didn't have a chance to, to get to meet him before he passed. And if I had that to do all over again, I would certainly make a huge effort to do so. Yeah, we have time for two more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Any, many, miny, mo. Your bow. This is very random, but your <laughs> Internet Explorer commercials are pretty funny. <laughs> Do you yeah. ever suffer from shyness? <laughs> sharing heavily, yet not enough sharing still. That's very good. That's good. Uh, Bobcat Goldthwait directed those uh, Internet Explorer commercials. And he is so crazy funny and ridiculous. <clears throat> and for me, that was a real, as an actor, that was a big stretch to go ahead and try to do something like that because you really could be ridiculed for that. Um, my favorite one of those, if you haven't seen those, it's, uh, they're ridiculous. They're very fun. My favorite one of those was when the one kid goes, Dean Kane lives in our chair. <laughs> it was the most random thing, but I literally couldn't stop laughing for about a half an hour after I saw it. Because I sort of rise up from out of a chair. Um, and it's just, it was just very funny. Um, Everyone's on their phones going, what is that? <laughs> look, look them up, the Internet Explorer YouTube. commercials. They're very, very funny. And that was a lot of fun for me. Uh, I really enjoyed doing that. Uh, but, you know, comedy is a really scary thing as an actor. Because you do something, you put yourself out there, and nobody laughs. Woo-wee! That's a tough one. When you hear crickets. So, I mean, that's, a, that's why they get paid so well. You know, Will Ferrell, guys like that, they're so funny. You know, when, he, when Will Ferrell screams at somebody and it's really funny, it's funny. You know, he yells at you and he, it, it's funny. When I yell, I've done it. It's not funny. I just look mean. I'm like, that's just terrible. <laughs> but uh, certain people have that gift. And um, that was a, a fun foray into comedy. Comedy is great. It's great, um, but it's a it's a risky proposition. I knew I was uh, I was on the edge on that one, so it was fun. Thank you for bringing that up. Good. You sir in the red shirt. Uh, you ever get tired of the whole Superman thing? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't get tired of the Superman thing. I mean, Security. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get tired of that at all. I mean, because, uh, you know, there was, uh, they would joke about it. when I was a kid, there was joking. I was a good athlete, I was a good student, and I would get, you know, hey, you're Superman. I've got, I had those comments, literally, it was as a joke. And when I, when I ended up uh, being cast in the role, some people were like, well, tch, I told you that before, which was really flattering and a nice thing. Um, but, I mean, no, it's, 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 it's the greatest American icon there is. So to be able to play that is amazing. You know, there's times where it's daunting, you know, like before a sports contest, or like, okay, or before Stars Earn Stripes, you know, I do that, did that show, and, you know, uh, it's great to play a character like Superman, but then you get a guy like Chris Kyle next to you, who's a real-life Superman who's been in the middle of more horrifically dangerous situations, and you just go, yeah, I'm an actor, you know, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but to be known as that character is great. When I was in Iraq in 2005, visiting the soldiers, it was, it was, they have great sense of humor, gallows humor in the middle of a battlefield. And I was at some forward operating bases where we were taking fire. And they're like, dude, it's okay. We've got Superman here. I'm like, would you stop that now? Because that's terrifying. So, you know, but they just keep that sense of humor going. And it's very funny. You know, and it, um, uh, so it, I embrace it. I, I'm happy. And if it stopped me from getting other work, then I might be upset. But uh, I've been fortunate to be able to do an awful lot of work since. And literally, general, generaliza- as, gener- sorry, as generations pass, there are tons of people who don't even recognize me from having played the role. I mean, the kids that are there now, they have no idea. I've, I, it was an interesting thing to uh, go from playing uh, Clark Kent Superman to going into uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Because there was a time where I, I flew into Atlanta and uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not was on, on the air and stuff. And, uh, I was coming up to get my bag, and some kid goes, hey, hey, you're the guy from Ripley's Believe It or Not. And I was like, whoa, that just changed in, a, in about a week and a half. <laughs> and that's the nature of having any sort of celebrity. You know, you're there, and then 15 minutes later, you're not, and that's okay. I think it's actually really healthy. Um, you know, the, some people hold on to it for a p- particular period of time, and some people don't. I still look at Val Kilmer and remember his Doc Holiday stuff and things like that. You know, it's great. Um, and I'll still call Matt LeBlanc Joey from Friends. Not to his Always. face, I'll call him Matt. You know. 
Um, but it's, it's, that's just what you do. Ross is still Ross. Um, and it's okay. Those are characters, you know, Jerry Seinfeld's character. I mean, the things that you do when you really own a character, Alan Alda is always going to be, you know, Hawkeye to me. And that's, and that's okay. And, I, and, I, and if people consider me Superman, I'll take it. That's all right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Kane. <laughs> Dean, are you heading back to your booth? I'm heading back to my booth. I'm not